Hey guys, welcome back. I have a super special video for you today. I took some time to reflect on what I really enjoy using, pulling those things together so that I can share my favorite supplies from 2023 with you. This past year, I've gotten way more into sketchbooks than I have in the past and using sketching materials and drawing as part of also my painting practice. And before, if you've seen my artwork and you've seen, you know, other videos on this channel, if you go to my Instagram, you won't see it anymore. I deleted about 200 photos on there of art that just, it wasn't me anymore. It's not even close to what I'm doing. And I didn't even want to look at it anymore because I'm the type of person where once I'm done with something, I'm done. I don't even want to look at it. But I had been doing art journaling for ages and mixed media painting and doing a lot of collage and using, making like my own stamps and all that. But I am not doing that anymore. And I really narrowed down my supplies into the things that I use often and that I really enjoy using. So let's dive in. So these are my absolute favorites for the year. My color palettes change from season to season. So I grabbed what's mostly like a wintry palette. And I've got a stack of books here that I'm excited to show you of things that are really inspiring me right now. So just want to go through what I have here and then we'll do some swatching, but I'm going to I'm not going to swatch every single color, but I'm just kind of going to show you like how I'm using them to layer and create different textures and things. So it'll be kind of like this loose, messy swatching thing um, where I can show you what I'm up to. So for paints, it really depends what I'm doing. If I am making an actual painting, right now what I really like painting on is Bristol paper. and. I find it's more um, consistent than mixed media paper. I find mixed media paper from brand to brand. You don't really know what it's gonna feel like or if it's gonna be a little textured, but Bristol paper seems to be Bristol paper and it's basically like a really smooth um, sized paper. And so the this book I just use for painting experiments. So these aren't like finished paintings. They're not trying to be finished paintings. But I come in here with acrylic paint and I'll use pencils and actually oil pastels. And the oil pastels are fine if you're gonna have thin layers of acrylic paint over it. It doesn't make the paint fall off when it's that way. So that's kind of a tip. If you wanna use oil pastels and acrylics, you can kind of get away with it. If you do really thick oil pastel and then thick acrylic paint, it's not really gonna work so well. Um, but I find using it this way is fine and these this is the paint that I use and I find Liquitex Basics to be pigmented just fine it's more than a student quality paint but it's not quite as pigmented as say their professional line um, I don't like heavy body paint and what I want is actually like a matte soft body so it's like I have a big bottle of acrylic gouache that's basically um, what this is like to paint with and the way that I do that is I just take an empty bottle like this and I take a four ounce tube of the medium body paint and I take a four ounce bottle of the fluid and I add a little to the bottle at a time, shake it up and keep adding it. And then I have eight ounces of paint and it ends up being like $10 or so for this, maybe a little more for this bottle of paint. And so that's what I do when I am painting. And I have another huge pad of this, by the way, you can get huge Bristol sheets. So I have another pad that's like 30 inches by 22 inches that I put up on an easel if I wanna do a bigger piece. Um, and just in terms of other substrates, if I'm gonna be doing more painting than sketching, but I'm still working in a sketchbook, so it's more like a sketchbook painting, but it's more wet supplies than dry supplies, like I'm using, acrylic gouache and things like that. I tend to use this kind of paper. This is a Ranger Dilutions journal. I've used these for art journaling for years. They're really great. Um, and the paper is really nice. It's very sized. It's got that nice creamy color to it. Um, there's also a pocket here if you like to store things. I don't really use it for that. Um, but I kind of like doing some swatching on one side and then a piece on the other. So there's another one. 
And I feel like the heavier the paper, um, the more opaque and the more covered I'm okay with it being. Like, I don't mind filling this up and having this be opaque and a little bit um, heavy in terms of just weight with paint and things like that. What I find though is I like the art creations better for sketching and not covering the whole thing heavily with paint. I'm trying to show an example. I don't know if I have one in here where it almost, like this is okay, but it almost feels a little bit overworked on this type of paper. This paper and the art creations can handle a lot. It's very smooth. So you can fill it up with paints and things like that. I don't want anybody to think that they can't do that. I just prefer using this in a way where some of the paper is showing through and it feels more like a sketchbook and less like a paint book, if that makes sense. And so these are just some little map crunch sketches that I had done. That was a sketch that went very wrong on Thanksgiving, overworked. And this is where I started really noticing that I really don't like covering everything um, in these type of pages. And there's a cute little wintry sketch. And I like sort of these contour type drawings where there's some value and some pattern, but there's a lot of the paper showing through too. Those are really fun. This got a little bit too filled up. I wish a little bit more of the paper was showing, but this is of Onset Bay. So this is right down the street from my house and the ocean and the birds. That was a little map crunch one. This is also, this is I think Muddy Cove near my house. Um, and so that's what I like to use this for. I also have like a wide variety of mark making tools. So there's some on the tray over here that I'm gonna show you. But for transparent stuff, I like to play around with inks and my preference is Liquitex for inks. And I find these just go down really nicely. They're kind of matte and sink into the paper. I used to have a bunch of golden inks, but they almost have, I don't know, where they're really saturated or a little bit kind of thick, they get a real plasticky look. And I don't like that. Makes things stick together in the pages and then you can't get other materials over them. And I find these um, much better. These are the mix of markers that I'm using right now. I just got some Eco Lines. I've already had some Tombows. They're very similar to each other. They've both got a brush tip. If you like having a more pointy tip, you might like the Tombows better because they've got the brush tip and they've got like a small sketching tip too. Um, one of the things I notice is the Tombows will dry out uh, a lot faster than the Eco Lines. The Eco Lines seem to have more fluid in them. So if you're sketching, and I suppose this is just like, it'll give you two different looks, but like if you're sketching with these, it's like more fluid comes out and goes down on the page, not in a runny way, but just in a more even way, where I feel like the Tombows will, it's almost like kind of, sketching with a slightly dried out marker. The marker definitely comes down, but not as kind of moist as the Eco Line does. And I still like both because I like using them for different reasons because of that difference. Here I've got Holbein acrylic gouache and I've really been enjoying these. I love that this comes in this creamy color that's similar to the pages on like the art creation sketchbook because I don't always like to use a stark white. And in fact, my white that I usually like to use is like a warm one like this. And I don't know, I just really enjoy these. They're matte, they're come in a ton of different convenience colors. And so what I chose here was just kind of like a range of colors that's nice for a wintry palette. Same with the markers. Um, a lot of muted colors and cool colors, but with some pops of warmth in there too. And then the other thing I'm really enjoying are colored pencils, which I never thought I would ever get into until like a year ago. And I use a combination of Caran d'Ache Luminance and Derwent uh, Light Fast pencils. And I like both of them. They come in such an enormous range of colors that are super fun to use. The way that I usually pick mine, aside from this being kind of a wintry palette, 
is I make sure I have a range of values. So most colors are midtones. So if you see like a saturated color where you can say that's a yellow, that's a red, they're going to be on the range in the middle. Like the red might be on the darker midtone and the yellow might be on the lighter midtone, but they're not actually a light or a dark. Something that's almost white is going to be a light and something that's almost black is going to be a dark. So I find it helpful to have that range in there. And in fact, I could probably use a couple lighter pencils in here because you can just see that. I'll probably grab like a creamy white or something like that. Um, and the thing that I'm loving storing them in, this was just a cheap case on Amazon, is this little thing. And it's like a zipper pouch. And just so that you're aware, the eco lines will fit in here, but the Tombos are just a little bit, sorry, it's off camera. The eco lines will fit in here, but the Tombos are just a little bit too tall. This won't zip um, with those in there, but you can zip it and take it places. But the cool thing about this is it's got these two tabs on the side. So you can pull it down and just stand it up. So it'll stand up like this, and then you can see all your pencils and markers without having to dig around in a bag. So then I have this little tray, and these are more like staples that I just have on my table. So these are Neo Color 2s, and this is pretty much the palette that I always have in these because these are just the colors that I reach for. I might throw a couple more wintry colors in here just to change it up. I usually don't use these till the very end because I'll use them kind of like an oil pastel, like a finishing touch or something like that. Um, but materials don't tend to go over this. Acrylic wash will, but most other stuff won't. And so I leave this, you know, for something nice and thick and opaque for mark making at the end. And these are my oil pastels. I use really inexpensive Mungio Gallery oil pastels and you can get a huge box of them for super cheap. I like these better than Snellier. Um, I have some of those oil pastels. And I think the difference is your real high-end artist quality oil pastels tend to be a little bit more oily and a little bit more mushy, probably because true oil pastel artists like to blend with them. Um, and I just want to mark make with them. So these are firmer than those. And that's why I like them. I don't tend to use these in my sketchbooks though. Um, I don't know, I feel like they just feel a little bit heavy. Sometimes I'll use them in this one though, over like acrylic gouache, but I feel like when I'm doing sketchy things, like this is just, there's too much weight to it, I don't need it. Another mark making thing I like, and again, a very similar palette, are these are Prismacolor New Pastels. I think they're Prismacolor. They're new pastels. Um, I'll link them below. I'm pretty sure they're Prismacolor though, but what I like about these is they're a hard pastel and they come in a rod and usually break them up so that I have half um, on my table and half, you know, in a drawer somewhere. These are really good because they don't break apart the way soft pastels do, but you can still use them on the side to lay down color. You can use them for more precise mark making. And for me, these are a lot more versatile than soft pastels. I think if I was really into layering pastels in a way that I wanted to be able to do a lot of blending, that's where soft pastels would come in handy. But since I don't do that and I just lay it down as like an initial layer or put some marks in, these are much better for me. This is one of my favorite pencils. This is called a Kimberly pencil and it's by General Pencil Company and it's a 9XXB. So it's super dark and it's basically, if you can see the tip, it's like having a really chunky dark pencil and it's super fun for drawing with and making lines and marks. And then these are acrylic markers. Again, I just pulled some out that are in a wintry palette. I have Molotov, Liquitex, and Poscas, and I the chunkier the better. So I either like these big ones or chisel tip ones like this. I have a few skinny ones, but I don't tend to pull them out as much because I like just using them to lay down some quick color. This Posca though, so even if I'm not gonna work like a bunch with acrylic markers, I'll still keep this Posca like in my pencil case with my pencils because what this is nice for, it's a little bit, it's actually pretty transparent. You can color over stuff to knock things back. And let me just find a page in here. 
you can kind of see because I already did it some right there but you can go over stuff and you could leave it you know like that or you could blend over it it's moving the marker a little bit um, but you might like that and you could do it over the pencils too and knock some of that pencil marking back. So I keep that around just because it helps give me depth in my sketching. Sometimes when I feel like it's looking a little bit too flat. And then I think the last thing for supplies is my gouache. And so I have two sets, they're all Holbein um, gouache, which I prefer. So again, these are regular gouache. These aren't the acrylic gouache. And so this is an art toolkit palette. As you can see, it's very slim and great for taking places. When I'm using gouache at home, I don't use this though because I don't wanna have to keep refilling it. Um, the pans can get used up pretty quickly. But as you can see, it's a great way to be able to just take a bunch of colors um, with you in a really compact way. These down here are a few Daniel Smith watercolors. And there's a mixing area over here. And I find that it's not too expensive for these, but I find these really good if you want something you can just throw in a bag to go, you know, quick plein air sketching or something. When I'm at home, this is a Meaden watercolor case. There's tons of similar ones out there though. So I just bought this and put the gouache in some half pans. And now I've got more gouache um, in the pan so it won't get used up as fast and I don't have to refill it as fast. I have more mixing area, so it just makes more sense if I'm working from home to use something like this. All right, let's take a look at the books. So these are things that have been inspiring me lately and I just got into this. I noticed that a lot of artists slash illustrators are making zines now and I absolutely love that. Please continue making stuff like this because I will buy them. I know lots of other people buy them. I have some on the way from Francis Ives that I'm really excited to get but it's a great way and I'm not going to show you every page because I feel like I don't know I don't like to show all the pages in somebody else's art book because it's up to them whether they want somebody to be able to see the entire inside before they buy it, but I'll just pick a page. And it's a nice way to basically have some pages from somebody's sketchbook and be able to just look at them and look at the textures and pour over it without looking at it through a screen. And I know myself, I'm trying to be on my phone less. Lots of other people are trying to be on their phone less. And so this is a nice way to be able to have some art books and the art styles that I'm really enjoying right now. And again, this is Melanie Chadwick and it's Landscapes of the Lizard, volume one. This is The Creative Act, A Way of Being by Rick Rubin. This is a super cool book if basically you want some inspirational snippets about making art because what this book is basically of, it's not even chapters, it's not like a lengthy book, it's easy to get into. You can dip in and dip out of it. It's basically like a bunch of short essays about art making. And so if you're looking to add something to maybe your art practice, or your studio practice where you sit down and you just want to have something maybe that's inspirational to just dip into before you get started and maybe read one or two of these, this is really nice for that. It's just, it's like reading a book about all the things that you've started to figure out about being an artist and art making, but couldn't articulate yet. And Rick Rubin was able to do that, thankfully. And so it's, it's like confirmation that what you're going through and what you're starting to notice the artistic life and artistic processes is you're not crazy. That really is just kind of how this is. And the next one is an old classic. This is Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain by Betty Edwards. I've been getting into drawing more. I used to draw when I was learning how to do fine art and oil painting, so I already kind of know how to draw, but I'm coming at it from a different, looser direction now. And this is really interesting to kind of go through these exercises. And she talks about the ways that drawing impacts your brain and um, how drawing is actually a really good thing for everybody to be doing because it's good for your brain. But it's just got like 
different exercise in it? Why should you draw? What does it do for you? Like, how does it impact your life kind of a thing? And she's updated it numerous times over the years. So this isn't a book that was written, you know, like 40 years ago and just sat there. This has been edited and updated since then. This is the Illustrator's Sketchbooks by Martin Salisbury. This is a super cool book to have if you like sketchbooks because it's basically a compilation and you can pause the screen if you want to see who's in here but it's basically a compilation of a bunch of different artists sketchbooks from the past and the present along with so I'll show you pages so you can kind of see this is somebody's sketchbook pages and then I'll find a page that's got some text and then on some of them they have some text about the artist or their process and I just find this like this is a cool page it's a cool book just to flip through and look at stuff but there's also you know, some writing in here for some extra inspiration. So I'm enjoying that. And the last one is the Devin and Cornwall Sketchbooks by Emma Carlisle, since I'm super into sketchbooks right now. I just found this so inspiring. This is um, her sketchbooks from a certain period of time in her life within a certain place. There's some text in here where she kind of goes into her journey and her artistic process. And it took me, I think, two hours to really go through this whole book just because it was so well put together and beautiful and inspiring. It made me want to go draw. And I'm again, I'm not going to show you the whole thing because this is somebody else's book, but I'll just kind of show you a couple of the pages. So you can go through and it's like being able to flip through Emma Carlyle's sketchbook. Um, here's another page and then I'll just show you one more with some text on it. So most of this is pictures just so you know. So if somebody is like, I don't want a book with a bunch of heavy reading in it, that's not what this is where when there's text, it's like a snippet, you know, on a page just to put the sketches into context. So I hope that, you know, this maybe inspires you to check out different books from different artists and, you know, maybe check out some different supplies or reflect on the supplies that have really inspired you this year. So I think now we're going to get to making some super messy layered swatching. First thing I want to do is show you the inks and this is a transparent burnt sienna and this is phthalo blue green shade. I don't think I don't have an ultramarine which is what I actually want um, but if you take a blue and a burnt sienna because they're complementary because burnt sienna is like a neutralized orange you get really nice natural range of colors that are great for winter. This does work a little bit better, I feel like, with ultramarine. Thalo blue is a good color to have, but it's just, I find it so strong. It's just a little bit much, but this will be, this will be close enough, and I'll kind of show you the range of colors you can get with it. If I can find my paintbrush, because I set up, and now I know when my kids took my cat, he took my paintbrush, so let me just go grab another. I'm just gonna go ahead and start mixing these in various proportions. And and so you can get like these really rich greens and almost gray colors and if you use burnt sienna like I said with phthalo I mean not phthalo blue ultramarine you'll get you'll get like a true gray they're more they're more perfectly opposite each other than these two are you can come in and this is nice because when you come in with the white too it gives it a very gouache look to it I can come back in and make this a little warmer and get a more raw umber type of a color. 
add a little more blue. It really doesn't take much blue to turn this with Salo. A really dark green. And so I love using inks this way in a dish like this, because if I forget about this, and I know I will, and the inks dry in here, the inks will actually come right off of this if you rinse it. And so the cleanup is easy. This is just a little ceramic dish. But yeah, so that's like a fun way to just get some nice neutrally colors that are very earthy. And I think what I'm gonna do now is I'll take some markers, thinking about what I wanna do or show you. Take some greens. So this is almost the same green as what's over there. So that'll build on here really nice. And I like to use the markers going in different directions so the marks can build on each other and it doesn't feel like the whole thing is one way. I feel like some of us tend to be up and down people, some of us tend to be right to left people. But when you can vary that, that's how you get depth. Like a lot of this over here is up and down, but just by throwing in some horizontal movement, it just feels like it pushes this back. And what is this? This one's a warm gray. And you can kind of tell what I was talking about before. The, the eco lines go down a little bit more moist. And so those are fun. These are like having some transparency. And when you put something opaque over that, that also looks really nice. Make this nice and loose. What else? Maybe we'll build some blues off of this. It's nice to have some muted things and some saturated things together because the muted things are going to make the saturated things pop. I love this color. This is indigo and the eco lines and it's just this really nice muted blue color. And what I'll do is, so this is one of the Neo Color 2s. I don't usually wet these. I use them like an oil pastel. They do make Neo Color 1s that are basically this, but not water soluble. But I find I already have these, first of all, and don't feel the need to replace them because once you put them down, they don't move if you don't add water to them. And the Neo Color 1s don't come in nearly the amount of colors that the Neo Color 2s come in. But that's, this is another way to add layering. Let's see, put a green over here, still a little bit wet. But you can see like, look how nice that looks coming over the ink and it goes right over it, no problem. You could do a lighter color, if you wanted to lighten an area up a little. So these are super fun. It's like, if you want something that's a little bit like an oil pastel, but you don't want to deal with the oiliness and the stickiness of the oil pastels. These are super fun to have. And maybe we'll add some reds and then we'll do the new pastels. So this is a really fun color. This is reddish brown. And then this is pastel red, another great color. 
stitch. I love the range of colors in the eco line markers because they've got some of these muted colors in there like that. And let's add some Liquitex marker, a little chunky thing. And you can get your fingers in it. And this particular pink, I add to a lot of my paintings. I mix it into a lot of my colors. And it really goes nice with that green right there. These markers tend to be a little bit shinier than the Molotov or the Posca. They're more of a like a satin finish, but if you work them into the paper, they won't have that glossy plasticky look. So more of a like a gouache look. And then I think we'll save the colored pencils until this stuff is super dry. Cause I find if even the marker areas are kind of wet, these don't go down as nice. So let's try doing some acrylic gouache. So this is wine red. I love this color, like absolutely love it. And we'll just put it over here, do a little area so it's mixing in with the Liquitex a little bit and getting pinky right there. I don't really use magenta or like a super kind of purpley red. I don't like them, but this is nice because it's kind of like an alizarin, like a really intense alizarin crimson. And so sometimes it's nice to have something that's a little bit cool for a red, even if you still don't use magenta. I don't use purple either. So this is shell pink and this is a nice warm pink, very similar to that Liquitex pink, but it's a little, little peachier and a little bit lighter. But I love this color. And grab some of this. This is ash blue. They have a few different ash colors. I have ash green and ash yellow over here. And then they have some misty colors. I think this is misty green and misty blue. And these are nice muted colors. You'll be able to see how nice this is. Just building things up. We'll throw some misty blue over here too, just to have another value. And put this, this is I think beige for the Posca. And I'll just put this in here to kind of fill in this weird gap. But see, you can go over other stuff with it and it changes the color. It's lightening it. So you can still see through it. It's got some transparency. Um, but it does change what's there and you can create some cool effects with that. Some of the most fun I think you can have with art supplies is just pulling out a piece of paper and doing something like this because you don't have the pressure of trying to make anything. Maybe you've already gathered the stuff that you're gonna play with that you feel like goes together. And it's a good way to just see how things play together and get some ideas or to maybe see if there's maybe something missing from your palette that you would really like to have. But this is the ash yellow and it's just a nice beigey color and so what this is doing is just kind of making these things it's like a bridge like there's a huge difference here I don't need to go around and get rid of that huge difference everywhere but if I have this bridge color that's like an in-between value and it's still in the same general family 
of colors, it kind of helps everything go together. And then if like I scumble over this edge and just put a little bit, it just gets rid of the harshness of that edge. You can just sit there and do that with colors and crayons and all sorts of stuff. Um, and just play with that aspect of things. This should be dry enough to put some pastels, but these are cool. Cause like I said, you can get really thin lines. You can get wider lines. You can do that and cover like a whole wide area with them. Let me see. Nice like dark red color. This is more like a burnt sienna or a maroon. And the other thing is too, if you like doing this, you can actually add water to the pastels to push it into the paper. Um, I don't tend to do that. I like to just put things down for the most part and leave it there for dry materials. And then I'll use brush for paint, but you can add water, like I said, to just, if you wanna push it into the paper. And that's your thing. And you can go right over that with other stuff once it's dry. All right, if this is dry enough up there. I can start using some pencils. I think that's the last thing. So I don't usually use oil pastels and I don't wanna use the regular gouache because it's just too wet. It'll take too long to dry. So we'll just finish up with these. But here's a nice light color and I can come over and get some more depth there. But I love this. I think it's, is it ice blue? It's light aqua. That's a really nice color. This is mallard green. And it's like a really nice, vibrant, cool green that you could use for like evergreen trees if you really wanted to pop a color. This is raw sienna. And again, I like to go over sometimes like the other color because this just creates a nice bridge between those two areas. This is perlene brown. is alizarin. So perlene, but there's a pretty much the same value. The perlene brown's a little bit warmer and the alizarin's cooler. Let's see what other colors might be fun. You know what, let's do ultramarine to add a pop of color. It's nice to have, um, you can have a whole muted piece, so you don't need to have pops of color, but if something's looking really muted, I like to have these little areas of saturation. I find I don't need a lot for me, but some is nice. So this is, I think, this is cinnamon. And so this is a subtle difference. Um, if you notice this, like this pink is just a slightly lighter value than this pencil, but having this pencil in the edge of these marks coming over this just adds subtle interest to it. And I enjoy doing things like that. What else can we fit on here? This is spruce green. I don't know if we'll really see this. Oh, okay. This is nice and dark. But you can see. And then again, going in multiple directions like that can really just add some interest to that mark making. So this is all kind of the same, except there's some differences in directionality and then the under color below them is different. And it just creates all these super subtle differences in the, this area. This is French gray. This is just a nice kind of warm, I don't know if it's even warm, it's almost slightly purpley, but it's warm somehow. And I really like French gray, but, but you can see how nicely the pencils are going down over this other stuff. It's not gonna work so well over something like, like you can see, it will go over the neo color a little bit, but 
the Neo color is too waxy, so it's not gonna take the pencil. And then let's get a couple really dark ones on here and just finish up with that. So this is, this is Idanthrone Blue, which is indigo. And this is what I mean about making sure that you have some dark darks in here because you can see how this is just adding contrast to this whole piece of paper in a meaningful way. Like this changed things by putting this here because it's so dark. And then I'll do that again with my other pencil. So this is Castle Earth. And I love this color because it's like having a black that's not quite black. It's like a really dark brown. But watch. Again, how this dark just changes things and adds to it. And you could use it for mark making. You don't have to cover a whole area. And see, this is going over, this is Neo color, so it's not quite going over it, but it is doing something interesting here. And so that's why I think it's important to play with stuff. You know, a lot of people are rules people and they're like, you can't do that. That's not how that works. It's not gonna go over it, but I think, no, I know. I know sometimes when you do this stuff, you're gonna get interesting things happening and you end up getting marks where when somebody else sees it, they're wondering, you know, how you did that in here. How did you get the pencil to do that? And it was from playing and just trying different things. So again, this is the Neo color under here and this is me going over it with pencil. It's not going down like it is here, but it is doing something here. It's just not necessarily doing what somebody might intend or think is going to happen. That's all. And yeah, I think that is everything. Um, I hope this gave you some ideas on how you can use your supplies. And yep, so I think that is everything. I hope this gave you some ideas on how you can use supplies like this to just try different things in your sketchbook or even mixed media paintings. Um, I think next week what I want to do is maybe a wintry sketchbook page. So we'll just have, maybe I'll put up some images ahead of time on a separate thing like in the YouTube feed. So if you want to grab the same images and I'll make a Pinterest board of them too if that's easier. The video won't be a live video because I don't know quite honestly how to do that yet, but we will do like a big winter sketching session and I'll have some references and I'll gather these same supplies and just hang out and sketch. And so it's something if you want to follow along, it's fine. If you just want to have it on in your studio and maybe try some of the same images or, you know, just do your own wintry sketches. I find it's just, you know, Doing artwork can be a very solitary practice and sometimes having artists just doing something in the background, I find makes things feel less solitary and just kind of keeps the juices flowing and makes me feel like I'm working, you know, alongside somebody else. It's really motivating for me. So again, I hope this was helpful. Um, I hope you go make some art today and thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.